And this is our task to respond and talk with Gabriel and co-create a beautiful love that is bigger than we are. But who is Gabriel? And how can I or we see him or her? What is this shimmering prayer presence that carries God's message to humans like Mary and me? So last night, I randomly Googled and a woman called Gabby on her blog describes the Archangel Gabriel this way. He is a messenger from God, the angel for communications. He helps artists, writers, and teachers share their message with clarity and meaning. The name Gabriel literally translate as, translates as God is my strength. Now, this confused me a little bit. So I went looking further back. What do the Jewish people say about uh, Gabriel? And uh, he first comes in the, the Tanakh, the Jewish Bible. He's first mentioned talking to Daniel. So Daniel has a, a dream, a prophecy, but he doesn't understand it. So Gabriel is sent to help him interpret the vision. Gabriel is a representation of God successfully speaking to humans, explaining things. And in the case of Mary, asking us to join our lives, the very fabric of our form, form to the outpouring of God's love. And this sounds very mystical and holy, but the thing about Christmas is it happens in the least expected way and in the least of holy times. And if you didn't know the story, you probably would not believe it. Can't help but jump back to last week. We were doing the Transgender Day of Remembrance. And there was a quote that I used by Martin Luther King. And I want to go back there because the point about the candle of hope is it shines like a beacon where there is darkness. That's where you can really strongly see it. So let's go back to Martin Luther King talking about darkness and hate. Here's what he said. Hate begets hate. Violence begets violence. Toughness begets a greater toughness. We must meet the force of hate with the power of love. Our aim must never be to defeat or humiliate the white man, but to win his friendship and understanding. Dr. King goes on to say the ultimate weakness of violence is that it is a descending spiral begetting the very thing it seeks to destroy. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And last week I went on to say, let love define you. This love that brought you into the world and that will also take you out on your deathbed. But something I didn't share last week was how incredibly powerful this path of love and peace is. If we align with creation and yield to that outpouring of love, if we grow and co-create our being within this sacred balance of the cosmos, amazing things happen. Here's a quote by a Franciscan saint called Angela of Foligno. And she had a lot of mystical experiences. Um, so here's what she wrote. Immediately the eyes of my soul were opened and in a vision I saw God's wholeness and the wholeness of creation in the sea and also in everything behind the sea in outer space. I saw nothing but God's power and God's presence. It was totally indescribable. My soul was overcome with wonder at everything. I shouted, the world is pregnant with God. That's when I understood how small creation is when the enormity of God is considered. God's power fills the seas and everything beyond it. I love that phrase that she has. The world is pregnant with God. Now, how this relates to the hope candle in my mind is this. 
Hope is not wishful thinking. It's a deep recognition and beholding of the sacred right in front of us. Krista Trippett writes, hope, like every virtue, is a choice that becomes a practice, becomes a spiritual muscle memory. It is a renewable resource for moving through life, not as we wish it to be. And today we're going to talk about hope as a spiritual practice so that we can um, light that hope candle in ourselves, in our own lives. So how does a spiritual practice of hope begin? Well, it begins with, as I said, a recognition of God's presence, a beholding, a seeing. But it's also, there's a mystery there because this is the start of the Christian liturgical year. And recently we had the start of the Celtic year for Halloween. The year starts in the empty womb, the blank slate, the womb and the tomb, the death and the passing of the past year. And we are handed a blank slate. So when I say that hope begins with recognition and seeing, it includes mystical seeing. And it starts with awe, the innocence and wonder of our child self, something we all have access to. Um, Ken Wilbur, I don't recommend you go and read Wilbur, but he um, talks about spiritual development a lot. And he says that we're whole archy that every aspect of who we are doesn't just vanish. We incorporate that. We are a whole archy and not a hierarchy. And I love that idea for humanity as well. So returning to the awe of a child that is still within us, a keen interest in life and death. When I work with children, especially if we're out and we see uh, baby animals or a dead creature, they're fascinated by it. They go straight up to it, trying to understand how life can be. Now, if we retain that awe and align it with praise, we can interact and connect with this outpouring of God. That's how it begins to hold the awe and align with it our praise. Here's a brilliant example of how to do this. Psalm 144 um, by Christine Robinson's interpretation. Let me see if I have, I think I, yes, I have this for you. I am awestruck, holy one, at the beautiful and boundless universe, gestated over eons with love and care. Your creative intent envelops the world like a cloak. I see it shining in the heavens, hear it whispering in the winds, feel it crackling in the fire. For you energize the dust of the universe, the galaxies, the stars, the planets, right down to this jewel of an earth. You birthed her like a golden babe from the fires under your heart. She cooled wrapped herself in water and in air. The waters receded, the mountains rose, storms shaped and softened the landscape, and in time she gave birth to life in her seas. In the eons, life evolved into myriad forms, each with its own niche in your scheme. With your love, she taught each its place, its work, its song, and humankind you birthed us too, gave us the world as our home and food, bread to eat, wine to make our hearts glad, herbs for healing and oil to soothe our skin. You gave us many songs, many powers, and put a restlessness in our hearts. We could seek you always. O oh, Holy One, how manifold are your works. In your love and play, you have birthed them all and raised them up. I will sing your songs all my days and care for all that you have created and keep my heart ever open to your love. So 
for years I wrestled with how to do that commandment about loving God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. How do you connect with a vacuum of nothingness? I think this is where Gabriel comes in. And let's continue to use the example of Mary and Gabriel. When the angel Gabriel, the shimmering form that carries the message from God, when Gabriel arrives on her doorsteps, she responds, attends, listens, and says yes. I urge us to apply the story to our lives. Now we can make Mary into a saint and a deity and put her up on a pedestal and petition her to act on our behalf, or we can co-create with her and join our voice with hers. And I believe that it is urgent and vitally important that we learn and model Mary's response to God. Saying yes to love in the face of the unknown, the uncertain, the unknowable. It's a huge ask. And it starts by having the eyes to see the sacred all around you. And then leaning into God's strength, leaning in to Gabriel. And then when the time is right, you will naturally follow through on this with your actions. But so much of it is about seeing. So I'm going to reinforce that, Sam, with a video by my friend Christine of Beholding hope starts the seeing and then leaning into that. It's not an idea that we create out of nothing. Listen to how everything sings. The streams and stones. Leaves and branches. Fish and fur covered ones. Birds leading the chorus. See how your desire to praise is echoed in every living thing? How in quiet moments, the heart is moved to gratitude for all of creation, for the lavish abundance of it all. How nothing is earned, no achievements are needed. May you simply show up with breath, blood, and bones, and your loving attention to hymns erupting everywhere, until you can no longer tell where yours begin and nature's ends. This relates to hope as a spiritual practice. If we go back to Krista Tippett, who said that hope becomes a spiritual muscle memory. Uh, We use it as a spiritual practice, and then it becomes a spiritual muscle memory that we respond from. One thing I'd like to note is that Mary continues to say yes through her actions, deeds, and care. She doesn't give up the baby for adoption or get rid of him when he's a teenager, telling the people in the synagogue the way God is. And when he's in his 30s and sharing his ministry, 
she doesn't stop following him when he gets in trouble with the authorities. No, she's there from the very start, from saying yes to Gabriel, right to the moment where she's at Jesus' feet and watches him take his last breath and return to the source of God. Part of how we use hope as a spiritual practice is consciously turning our reactions into the yes. Yes to God in the stranger. Yes to people who are different than me. Yes to this day. Yes to my marriage again today. Yes, I make space in my family for the vulnerable teenager. Yes, I share my heart and my possessions over again. Yes, I care. And this is surprisingly difficult to do. To focus on God so that you stop that self-righteous ego narrative and the scarcity thinking from sneaking in to speak first in your thoughts. Richard Rohr says, if you start with a reaction of no, it is very difficult to get back to yes. And like gratitude, hope has a prerequisite state. Now, what I'm getting at here is what Brene Brown found in her research on gratitude, that grateful people are not the people who have the most circumstance to be grateful for. Hopeful people aren't the ones who have the best lives. It's actually retroactive. It's got nothing to do with things going well. It's a choice we make, and then we go out there and find the hope, we find the gratitude. And hope and gratitude open us to the blessings hidden right there in our life. In summary, hope starts with recognizing power and beauty and the presence of God all around us, and then leaning into that strength And then from there, we respond from a place of love, creativity, and God's majesty. Close in prayer. May we simply show up with breath, blood, and bones. May we show up with our loving attention to the hymns erupting everywhere, to your holiness, until we can no longer tell where our yes begins and the yes of your cosmos ends. Amen. So may we know the hope that is not just for some day, but for this day, here, now, in this moment that opens to us. Hope not made of wishes, but of substance. Hope made of sinew and muscle and bone. Hope that has breath and a beating heart. Hope that will not keep quiet and be polite. Hope that knows how to holler when it's called for. Hope that knows how to sing when there seems little cause. Hope that raises us from the dead, not someday, but this day, every day, again and again and again. And it's with this hope that we blow out the candle and send that hope out to the world. Amen.